Fallout New California, more than any mod I've covered on this channel, screams of unfulfilled potential. New California was one of the first and most ambitious attempts to fulfill a dream teams have been chasing for more than a decade and a half now, a full-size total conversion fan game in the 3D Fallout engine. Fully voice acted, choice and consequence, a new world map the size of the main game itself, I've been following this mod for as long as I've been interested in mods at all. New California began under a different name, that being Project Brazil, and as a mod for Fallout Fallout 3. When New Vegas came out, that's how old this project is, they shifted into that engine. It was to be a return to the lore and world of the classic Fallout games, which are my favorites. When the demos for the mod came out, I played them and I loved them. They were doing things no mod was doing at the time, and all the lead up felt like exactly what I was looking for. But, due to the mod still technically being in beta and the last update coming several years ago, it wasn't what I was looking for, merely a ghost of a project that could have actually done it. This video is an archaeology just as much as it's an analysis, because within this mod are the seeds of future mods to come and the skeleton of a mod that could have been the greatest Fallout fan work we've ever had. This is an analysis and review of Fallout New California. The story opens with a very well-crafted cinematic with its own style that transitions into a TV screen in the wasteland just like in Fallout 1. This is followed by a second opening cinematic which lays the foundations for the plot as well as the themes of the story. War. War never changes. Makes a strong man weak and a poor man rich. The difference is decided by character. And if you don't think character is the only factor in deciding victory, then you've been playing the wrong game this whole damn time. More on that later, but for now, you're a football player, welcome to Vault 18. Vault 18 is where the game begins and where it undoubtedly peaks. Most mods you can kind of tell are mods based off the eye test, but this is one location where this is not the case at all. This prologue section in the vault could easily have been part of a fully produced Fallout game. The prologue gives the player the capacity to make a wide variety of choices which impact the entire rest of the game in ways that the game itself fails to top after this section. The choices begin right from the start. You are a player on the vault's football team and you're about to make the game winning play. Do you tackle or dodge the opposing player who's about to flatten you? What you choose impacts the quests you have available to you in the vault, the companions you can recruit, the factions you can join, and the dialogue you have open to you for the entire rest of the game. We haven't even picked our special stats yet. These two options represent the path of the scientist and the path of the warrior. We'll go through both, but let's begin with the scientist. If we choose to dodge, we get immediately crumpled. God damn it, kid. What the hell was that, huh? and we wake up to this Portal 1 medical chamber. And meet the main supporting character in this path, Dr. Kevin Rossman. Dr. Rossman leads us to the main plot device which moves the prologue along in this path, Maria the Supercomputer. This quest is entirely optional, but Maria has several layers that we can unlock through science checks and go here flip switch, come back, go here flip switch, hack terminal, come back, go here flip. Some of these layers contain lore about Rossman and other mod characters, some of these are world building, but the culmination of this quest is a finale which exposes the experiment of Vault 18. The experiment of this vault was to determine how vault dwellers would react when exposed to the twisted truth of the vault experiments themselves. Maria recites the names and experiments of many of the vaults in the Fallout lore. Vault 20, Tucson, Arizona. A medical test to observe the effects of long-term exposure to transdelta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol. Air, food, and water are contaminated. But this experiment was never truly initiated until we completed this Maria puzzle centuries too late. A little more about Vault 18 here, as all vaults inevitably would, Vault 18 was faced with the question of inbreeding. After enough time everyone is somebody to everyone, and instead of like every other vault completely ignoring it, they chose to let in new blood. One of these newcomers from the wasteland is you. The quests in the first half of the vault prologue are, more than anything, tutorializing us on the layout of this area and introducing us to its cast of characters, that eventually you will have the ability to rescue from the vault when things go awry. After you've done your side quests and optional objectives, we can go to sleep and wake up to a cutscene that is Now you boys play this one real close to the vest and the overseer won't know what hit him. Way it's too loud. Can you turn the volume down just like 
like a little bit. The vault's football coach is an agent of the Enclave and he's doing January 6th. He's using an army of brainwashed patriots to take over the vault after losing the election to become overseer. We can choose to join or to fight the Enclave at this point in the story if we're on the scientist path, but on the warrior path this option actually opens far earlier. Let's take a look at how that would have played out. Instead of dodging, we make the game winning tackle. and find ourselves in the office of John Bragg, Patriot, baseball cap boomer, and coach of the vault ball team. What's interesting about this initial interaction with Bragg and many of the follow-up dialogues you get with him and his sister is that they're kind of a minefield. If you step out of line, they'll explode at you. If you step out of line far enough, you'll be locked out of the ending. Hell, if you pick your special stats wrong, Bragg will call you a loser and tell you to get out. In order to win Bragg's approval here, you need to focus on strength, endurance, and charisma and bend the knee to him in conversation. You do this properly, enough and you actually get a few perks which open enclave coded dialogue with many of the game's NPCs. The side quests in the vault for the jock playthrough are, in my opinion, much better than those of the nerd because while the nerd path is entirely locked out of jock content, if you're a jock character with solid intelligence and charisma, you can actually opt into what I can only describe as a micro subclass with the smart jock perk. This allows you to do all the Maria computer stuff we did as the nerd, which is, I think, the best content this zone has to offer. In picking the jock path, you get a little more of an introduction to Chevy Bragg, the coach John Bragg's sister and a character who isn't interesting and won't be relevant again until the final third of this mod. When you play as the nerd and Chevy appears in the final quest, it's highly possible you'll end up going wait, who are you? And because of that, it's probably best that you're introduced to her in the jock path. If you've sucked up to brag enough, you get to join the Enclave in the sieging of the vault rather than fight against them. And this takes us to the office of the Overseer. When you reach the Overseer in the Enclave path, Bragg insists that he must monologue villainously at him for just enough time for the Overseer to trigger the vault self-destruct. He'll be killed regardless, but if you take any initiative and kill him before Bragg can get the job done, you fill the quest and Bragg turns hostile. I'm not asking for the mod to account for every possible solution to every problem, but that being known, this is still a clear plot contrivance to make sure the vault blows up that the player could realistically neutralize entirely, but the mod won't let me so I'm throwing a hissy fit and kicking and screaming and spinning around on the floor like Homer Simpson. In either case, whether you join the Enclave or not, the Overseer triggers a vault self-destruct and you have to get gather your companions, escape the vault, and find a place to hide before Every single aspect of the mod after this point is marked by an overwhelming sense that it was intended to be something else. And what hurts is that you can very clearly see what that something else was going to be. What hurts even more is that these potential expansion points, these unfulfilled ideas, were all good. The clearest example of this phenomenon is the mod's companion characters. New California has a total of six human companions and three robot companions, and the former have about as much personality as the latter. Going over all of the companions in any detail would be pointless and probably impossible because as soon as we leave the vault, at least half of them cease to have a character at all. Few of them react to anything, and none of them have any sense of a dedicated companion quest. They begin the story as interesting characters, a la New Vegas, and after the prologue they become nondescript minion NPCs like in Fallout 3 or Skyrim. Some companions are straight up nothing the whole way through, which is the case for Jamie and Eric Campbell, two companions whose only character trait is that they are the primary example of the inbreeding problem mentioned earlier. They are adoptive siblings in a relationship, they can be broken up in the past of the warrior, and in the path of the scientist their relationship is left completely unexplained. After the vault, they do literally nothing. As I understand it, Jamie was intended to be replaced with an entirely different character, and this relationship plot was to be scrapped. But as is, it's as awkward as it is underdeveloped. Ben Kurtz is the most interesting companion in the mod, but that isn't saying too much. He has a backstory longer than a sentence and a unique quirk, that's where the bar is here. He was originally a wastelander like yourself, but his memories of the outside world were lost. When you meet him in the vault, he speaks as though his own memories are plot details in a comic book he's writing. After the event of the Enclave Uprising, his survival instincts kick in and he entirely switches, becoming the him that he was out there rather than the him that he is in here. This is a 
very fascinating idea for a character, and something that makes him more interesting than the rest of the companion class, but because as mentioned the mod is very unfinished, there's next to nothing that New California does with this idea. After the vault segment, he briefly plays a role as your second in command and advisor, and at certain points in the story he will actually comment on things around the world, but he has no arc or any development past. He was like this, and now he's in the wasteland again, so he's back to being like this other way. The other more scientist-focused companion is Kira Man, a character most people I've seen tend to seriously dislike, and for good reason, but who I don't mind for the same reason I don't mind Ben, because Kira actually has at least something interesting to her. She is a geek, and it's canon in the story that she has a form of autism. The only way we really see this in her is through antisociality. She is confrontational, rude, dismissive. Once again, there is room for a character here, but it's so unfinished that there never was one. One of the big moments of Kira showing the more abrasive aspects of her personality come through her treatment of Jen Hale, our next companion. Jen is unique as she is one of the only characters in the mod who were actually born in the vault and who has not spent any time outside of it. Jen was skeptical when Kira brought up the issue of parental abuse in her family growing up, and as such Kira has a lifelong grudge against Jen. This whole thing reeks of high school drama and it's pretty insufferable. Jen is barely a character outside of her relation to Kira, especially in the scientist path where you don't get her romance quest. In the jock route she has slightly more of a story, right after leaving Brack's office you can and, as they say, riz her up, sorry, and get invited back to her room in the vault. Knock knock. Hey kid, here to see my daughter, are you? Jen brings up some concern regarding a list of all the vault residents in Bragg's possession. Confronting Bragg about this leads us to learn that Bragg has been basically making a tier list of the vault dwellers based on combat readiness and potential to join his cause. We go back to Jen, tell her to not worry about it, and that's it. That's the closest thing to a character she gets. It's this meme, literally. Johnny Matheson is a companion exclusive to the jock path, and knowing that piece of information in combination with your understanding that all the companions in this game are extraordinarily one note, you know pretty much exactly what you're getting with this character. He's a jock, he's a bruiser, he encourages you to join the raiders, and he's very dependent on medics, a fact which comes up early in the story and then never again. If you take these companions at face value, your critique is likely to be that they act, look, and sound like teenagers. Kira is dramatic, Johnny and Jen are one note, Ben is an edgelord. What I think this criticism misses is what factor they all share which makes them appear so much like teenagers. They are all, at their core, underdeveloped. Like teenagers, they lack character. They aren't full human beings yet. They haven't reached that stage in their development. They are, by nature of this being an abandoned project, perpetually in adolescent stasis. So yes, they are pretty much all bad companions by New Vegas standards or even the standards of other mods. Except for the robots. The robots rule. Hey! You out there, you friend or foe? We come across a fork in the road. A drifter sits at a campfire, inviting us over. This can go over a few ways, but he looks friendly, he's friend-shaped anyhow, and listening to him gives us a good example of the performances in this mod and also a clue towards where to go next. To the left, the NCR, who are alright. To the right, vicious raiders who will tear you apart. So we're going left then, is what I'm hearing. What I'm hearing is you're telling us to go left, right? We're going left? Wait, wh what are you doing? Stop. No, stop. We're not doing that. Stop. No, stop doing that. This is a very video gamey thing to do. It reminds me a lot of the doors in Stanley Parable. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. This was not the correct way to the meeting room. In text, the game is telling you to go one way, but in design, it's giving you full autonomy so when you pick the second intended option, you feel like you're doing something outside of the story's intended structure. The game is tricking you into thinking that you've tricked it. It's pretty clever that way. Open world games in particular are great at giving you this feeling because instead of just giving you a red door and a blue door, you can move omnidirectionally, you can jump around, go in any which way you want. There are infinite 
infinite possibilities for the player to feel like they're doing something unintended and interesting, an infinite space for the developer to put in alternate intended experiences to account for and produce. This is then really unfortunate for New California because while this linear choice is good and the dialogue has a lot of room to accommodate player creativity, the open world itself fails spectacularly in this regard. Back when New Vegas came out, one of the big criticisms that fans of Fallout 3 had of it is that compared to Fallout 3's packed in urban open world, the Nevada desert felt very empty and uninteresting. Players of Fallout 3 weren't used to walking for more than a few seconds without finding a new location or a new enemy to fight. This is something super commendable about Fallout 3, it's tight. Compared to far too many games these days, it justifies its open world design with, well, open world design. Rather than just putting the player in a big old map, its world is designed such that it's fun to carve your way through to explore and to run around in. I don't fully agree that New Vegas' open world is empty, but I understand if you think 3's is better. To me, a little downtime in my open worlds is great, but the line of how much downtime is too much varies for different people. I bring all this up because if you thought New Vegas' open world was empty, I have no idea what you'd call New California. It's advanced empty. The mod is unfinished, I've said that before, I'll say it again, and you can see it very clearly in the visuals and the world. There are a decent number of locations, but not even close to enough to justify how large the map is. The locations that are there are mostly just combat arenas, and if they have houses or buildings, they'll just be empty prefabs or not even enterable at all. The few very fleshed out locations there are have a weird look to them stemming from a desire to make every location look great without as much of a concern for whether the locations look fitting. For example, in the main NCR city, there's a Boulder City sign. Speaking of sign, the mod's major tribal village location has a huge one made of neon for some reason. This mod really loves its big neon signs. A big issue that the main story runs into is that in multiple quests, it'll give you an objective marker for a location on the complete other end of the map, and I assume this is done so that the player doesn't accidentally sequence break. But what ends up happening is that you get these insanely long stretches where you're just walking. Walking towards an objective marker down roads with nothing on them, running into dead nothing on the way there. The world environment is noticeably different from that of base New Vegas, but not in any distinctly interesting way. It's just brown. Just like New Vegas is, it's just its own shade of brown. As mentioned, from what I'm aware the mod takes a lot of inspiration from the classic Fallout games, which is great, but one of the best parts about the open world in those games is that on your way to a location you need for a quest, you'd accidentally run into a totally new location to be sucked into. This made those games on a first playthrough feel as though anything could happen. You'd be on the way to one place and suddenly you'd find a new zone with entirely new possibilities and several new quests. Fallout 1 and 2's map travel is empty in the same way that I'd argue New Vegas's is. You have some long travel stretches of just walking, sure, but there'd always be something interesting or unexpected along the path waiting for you. Not every two seconds, this game was designed before TikTok Zoomer brain rot fully set in, but enough that the walking felt worth it. The walking in New California does not feel worth it. The single redeeming quality of the open world design in this mod is that the long, empty stretches of walking give you ample time to listen to the two new radio stations. NCPR is an NCR-controlled radio station which plays much of what you'd expect alongside music from Martin Purvis, who went on to make some music for The Frontier. His contributions are phenomenal, and the songs he did for New California have been in rotation for me for several years. I'll grant you a dream, a wish or two, to follow my lead. This is what I do. I said, hey, 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 that's what I do. So let me see you, Jitter, can you do that? The other radio station is a lot more fun, though. In the lore of New California, there was a vault, Vault 5, where Vault Tech tested human reaction to prolonged exposure to violent rock, metal, and punk music that in the pre-war world was banned by the US government. After exiting the vault, the remaining vault dwellers made savage by the devil music immediately became raiders and started broadcasting death. I like how this radio station provides lore context for music people definitely would complain about being lore unfriendly otherwise the music rocks Would you get nothing
One of the big things the mod boasts is its multiple faction story structure. You can leave the vault as an agent of the Enclave or not, and then at the fork in the road shortly after you can be directed towards the Raider faction or the NCR. There are a lot of ways to get the main story done, and the first of which we will be covering is the NCR plotline. Let's go pay some taxes! The first major stretch of empty walking is from that drifter in the crossroads to Union City, the center of the NCR's presence in the area. Fortunately for us, this is one long walk which actually does have something notable along it. We run into NCR Ranger Carrie Vargas and are enlisted in a massive battle between the NCR and the local raider faction. This is a good section to introduce the combat of the mod, which is largely the same as the base game with the one exception of scale. New California, much like its cousin project in the frontier, attempted to make the major battles of their respective main stories much grander and more ambitious. For the frontier, this meant cutscenes, set pieces, lots of explosions, and monologuing. For New California, it means wave defense and throwing triple the normal amount of NPCs in every battle. Which way, western man? This really is a pick your poison situation, and I think neither mod fully capitalized on what was essentially a good idea. In New California's case, these battles can be overwhelming. To counter this, the mod allows you to have as many companions as you want, there is no limit like in the base game. This means that in my first playthrough, I was rolling through New California with uh, three, four, carry the seven or eight companions I had on me at a time. So while the intent of the massive battles is to make each scene feel way more epic and impactful, you actually end up doing even less in each fight than you would in the base game fights if you have even a decent number of companions. A lot of people complained when this mod originally came out that the number of enemies in each fight was so much that it caused significant performance issues. I never experienced any issues with these fights personally, but I don't love this approach to making fights feel more important, regardless of whether or not it's an issue for performance. This design philosophy doesn't make fights feel more important, it makes fights feel more crowded, which isn't always a good thing. Fun side effect of there being so many enemy NPCs per fight is that the economy in this mod is completely busted. For the first half of the game, you will always have more than you need, because for every NPC that you go below for below with, there are 10 that your companions or other allied NPCs will kill for you. There's never a sensation that you're on the brink of running out of resources, like you might feel on the classic games, New Vegas Hardcore, or on the extreme end, Fallout Dust. Closer to the end of the game, the amount that enemies drop has decreased significantly, but the amount of enemies doesn't change, so you actually are a little bit more starved for resources, but not in any way that feels intentional. Anyway, after your companions deal with the wall of raider NPCs and you loot all their bodies, you can walk the other empty half of the road to Union City. There's a bar here, and a post office, and a bank run by the Shi from Fallout 2, but most most importantly, the NCR Territorial Headquarters, a building which is half government office and half boxing gym. I don't know what's going on with anything in the visual design of this mod. In this NCR location, we meet the central two characters to two of the game's factions and endings. We meet General Silverman of the NCR, who has one of the best voice performances in the whole of New California. Look, son, I don't know how close you were to Rossman, but he was a good man. If it were up to me, I'd have the president pardon him right now. The other is Senator Duville, technically part of the NCR, though he represents far more accurately the mob bosses of New Reno. I feel far more apathy towards this character than I do Silverman. He looks goofy, his voice performance sounds like it's from a cartoon. I have to rein him in before he drags us into a war. I'm going to have to ask for your cooperation in this matter. It will make my job much easier. Regardless of who you choose to cozy up to here early on, you don't make the final decision regarding whether you side with Silverman or Duville until pretty close to the end of the story, so everything from here on out is technically part of the NCR questline and the mob questline, if such a thing exists. Not really, it actually mostly doesn't, but I'll say it does anyway. Union City needs water, so they send you to the other end of the map to Ziabula. Ziabula is a gorgeous location that once again feels very unfinished. Huge location, maybe three NPCs you can actually talk to. Half the people in this village are blue like Na'vi, I wish I could talk to them about the whales or some shit. In order to get the water on, we can, well, fix it, or hilariously, we can carry 90 water jugs back to Union City to supply the city with enough water to sustain itself in the short term. Each of these jugs is like 15 pounds, making this objective the dead money ending if the dial spun up so hard it fell off. I'm willing to bet good money that the number 
of people who did this objective on hardcore with no fast travel and no companions is in the single digits. There's a free YouTube challenge for you if you want to take that on. If we choose to fix the water manually, we're led to a cave location which contains an AI hologram of Dr. Rossman. Turns out that he was a well-known man in this tribe, and he did a lot of work to ensure their stability and prosperity in his time in the wasteland. This conversation with him is one of my favorite moments in the entire mod because it feels very sweet and genuine in a way a lot of other parts of the mod don't. It's a nice little Obi-Wan Kenobi Force Ghost moment. After restoring water and power to the city, Silverman plans to send you to an entirely different part of the world map, just as far away but just in a different direction. Fort Daggerpoint is an old US military base that might have technology that the NCR wants. Silverman tells you to gear up and find allies to take with you. You can hire some mercenaries in the bar here and also one Anai Oran and her associate Jerry. Anai is a fascinating character at this point in the story, partially because she looks so unique but also because her voice performance is pretty strong. In this first interaction, you can get more or less information out of her regarding who she is and what her motives are through a series of stat and perk checks. And now is probably a good time as any to bring up a strange fact about New California. Almost all of the speech checks in the mod are checks on the player's special stats rather than their skills. Instead of doing a speech check, you'll do a charisma check. Instead of doing a science check, you'll do an intelligence check, etc. This change obviously makes some skills far less valuable. There are skills which are a lot more useful to spec into now, like lockpick and science for unlocking terminals, but there's also something insanely cursed about speech being a dump stat in a Fallout game. The other major meta shift is that pretty much the only perk worth investing in for the first several hours is intense training, the perk which lets you increase a special stat by one. Because nearly every check is a check on your special stats, the player is incentivized to have as high of a special sheet as possible. This is a problem because it totally destroys the concept of build diversity. Why why would you invest in any other perk unless you're going for a heavy combat run? But even then, for the companion reasons I mentioned a while back, as well as this special check system allowing you to bypass a lot of combat, that run is objectively suboptimal. Build diversity doesn't just mean you can build multiple characters and play in multiple ways. Build diversity, if done properly, means that the game gives you a reason why you should build multiple characters and play in multiple ways. The most optimal way to play New California is to collect as many companions as you can in the vault and then only invest in intense training until most if not all of your special stats are in the 8 through 10 range. Playing the game this way, you will gain access to the most possible content and also access to the fastest paths through the busy work parts of that content. New Vegas kind of has this problem too, there is no reason to not put points in speech in New Vegas, but New California makes this problem worse by having this situation infect the way the player engages not just with the skills, but with the perks and the special stats too. The commendable part of the speech system in this mod is that you can get specific perks and quests that open their own dialogue options later down the line. If you unlock deep into that computer in the vault, it'll give you super enhanced computer abilities later on that let you bypass hacking minigames. Interestingly, if you go on your computer in the vault and join what is allegedly an NCR dating site, you can talk to Anai Oran far earlier than you would otherwise. She ends up ominously warning you about the Enclave invasion, and when you meet her in person, this connection lets you press her a lot harder. You get way more information out of her this way because she knows who you are, you have her perk. In this conversation, you can convince her to give you the key to enter Fort Daggerpoint as well as recruit her as a temporary companion in your mission to penetrate it. Fort Daggerpoint is where the story gets a lot more complex and depending on who you ask, a lot worse. The fort isn't super notable until you reach an outside bridge area where you meet this Frank Horrigan wannabe. The super mutants are back in this one and you can choose how cool you are with that idea by running away or hearing him out. Out. The story makes way more sense if you let him cook though, so just hold on. The previous name of the mod, Project Brazil, is the name of one of the US government's many mutation projects. This one was intended to find immortality. What they found was… well, it's not not immortality. They basically found a way to mutate a human such that they maintained human form but gained superhuman powers. The Project Brazil mutants had strong resistance to radiation, were stronger and faster than regular humans, and could naturally regenerate like Wolverine. 
Through Project Brazil, they also developed a method of human cloning. The first to be cloned was Anai Oran, who was cloned three times, once into her partner Jerry Oran, and then into the Enclave leaders Chevy and John Bragg. Yes, the coach from the vault is a male clone of Anai Oran, the mysterious wasteland bounty hunter. But it doesn't stop there. You yourself are a clone, and a clone vital to the super mutant operation. According to the super mutants here, you are a clone of the Vault Dweller from Fallout 1. The story's coming off the rails a little bit here. Now, okay, I don't actually hate this idea as much as many people do. It's out there, definitely, and I understand people who absolutely hate this. It is fanfiction service schlock, but I like it for that exact reason. It's silly, it's neat. I wish it was foreshadowed a little more than it was, and on a terminal in the little base they're in there, you can actually find out that this is not the case. You are not actually a clone of the Vault Dweller, but you only find out if you're digging through terminals, so I wish that part of the story was expounded on a little more. It is foreshadowed a little bit. There are a few instances in the game where characters will call you Vault Dweller, and on my first playthrough I thought that was strange, seeing as how that name has very clear connotations in the story to an already existing character. And when the reveal happened, I had that moment of retroactive realization all good twists give you, but that detail is something one could have easily overlooked. I wish they did more with it. As it stands now, it's just a big twist for the sake of having one that doesn't make as much of a difference as I wish it did. Anyway, the Super mutants want you because if they turn a perfect Project Brazil subject like you into a super mutant, they will be able to clone you as a super mutant, essentially nullifying the big problem of super mutants in Fallout 1, their sterility. Right here is where you can get the early super mutant ending if you wish. This is one of my favorite endings in terms of presentation, though like a lot of this mod I wish they did more with it. Throw in an after ending scene or two where you wake up in your new body and talk to the super mutant leader we still haven't met. The Frank Horrigan guy here even promised you if you jump into the vat, you'd get to meet him afterwards, but I guess that happens off screen. What happens on screen is I guess the super mutants go to space. Good for them. Good, good for them. All right, final mission. The Enclave have nukes because there are nukes in Dagger Point actually, so the Enclave are there with the mutants. They're both there with the nukes. The wheels are off the bus. We are on a boat sliding down the highway. The final quest contains four boss fights, three of them being completely bypassable. First, we need to deal with the mutants. In Fallout 1, in terminal entries, you could learn that Richard Gray, or the Master, did not act alone. Among his team researching the FEV was a guy named Mark. This is Mark. Hi, Mark. Mark gives us an exposition dump, but unfortunately most of this dump is just the dump the other mutant guy did. There's no contingency in place to bypass the dramatic Vault Dweller reveal if the player already knows it. We just get to hear this plot beat that most people hate twice over. If we have a 10 in Charisma, which we will, I've already told you how to cheese every dialogue check in this game, you can convince the father that he should wait to fight you until the Enclave infesting his base are dealt with. And then you get Mark as a temporary companion. If we're siding with the Enclave, we have to fight Anai Oran in this big mutated form, but if we're playing as anything else, she joins us like the father does. She is the one boss fight here that there is no convenient quick fix to. Her gun is way too loud and her fight crashed my game twice. Finally is John Bragg, who we can tell our big robot to vaporize if we have him with us. Well, that was uh, easy. Let's do the lonesome road nuke choice thing while we're here. Hold on, I need to rant a little bit. The Enclave are so boring in this mod, I almost wonder what the point of including them at all was. They're largely superfluous to the plot after the Vault Raid, and I Oran and Jerry being clones of the two main Enclave characters and the clones being clones of each other is contrived, and because they never interact, there's no cool character moments there. Would it really have made a difference if it was mutants raiding the Vault? The only redeeming aspect of the Enclave as a villain faction in this storyline is that John Bragg gives a hell of a performance. His villain monologue is one of the only few that actually work for the story that the mod is trying to tell. Impossible? <laughs> like you ain't? An out of shape little nerd that can't even handle a vault ball turns into Captain Cosmos in a week? I've seen your handiwork scattered all over the wasteland. You have a death toll that'd make any general proud. Too bad you were born on the wrong side of some mutant line of genetic code. You'd make a fine weapon.
It's very strange that choosing a location to bomb as the final choice in two official Fallout DLCs and two major DLC sized mods is really not that compelling, guys. We get it, war never changes, but all we do is pick a name on a list and we never hear about it again. You can choose to nuke Fort Dagger Point, or you can choose to target all the remaining Enclave sites containing FEV, which is the wish of an IRAN. Or, this one's a little interesting, you can power the nuke off and use it as a bargaining chip for whatever faction you sided with, essentially starting a new Cold War. In any case, an IRAN chooses to sacrifice herself in the flame of the nuclear eruption to put an end to her far too extended life as a clone. After making your decision, you report back to your chosen faction leader and the mod ends. I'm not going to talk about the endings and ending slides until the very end because before we take a step back and look at the full picture, I need to finish painting the other half of it in the Enclave Raider and She Paths. The raider path can begin in one of two ways. First, we go back to that path with a kind drifter and completely ignore his advice. The other way is actually a lot easier. Back at the house we bunker down at with our companions, a band of raiders approaches in the night. Most ways this plays out ends with the raiders becoming hostile and a shootout occurring, but if you mess it up badly enough you give the raiders enough of an opening to grab you. This is my preferred way to start this quest, it feels a lot more dramatic. I think that much of a player's motivation to join or to not join a faction is generated by the character of that faction's leader. For a Fallout example, if the Minutemen in Fallout 4 were led by a character other than Preston Garvey, I'm sure a lot more players would be persuaded to work with them. Honestly, same thing with a railroad in that game. My point is that if a faction leader doesn't endear themselves to the player in some significant way, their faction's ideals or goals are irrelevant. A lot of players are just going to start looking elsewhere. As an AI language model, I am programmed to be completely politically nonpartisan and only entertain you by explaining games at you rather than extracting any kind of meaning. As such, I am not allowed by the powers that be to read into this fact of gamer psychology. There is surely nothing there. Don't think about it. Uh, sorry about that. What I was going to say is that because of all that, it's a shame that Elge Dragon's character is such a rough spot. His writing and voice work is one of the clearest indications that this is a mod we will find in New California. He's just as one note as Senator Duville in his writing, but he doesn't have the voice acting presence to overcome any of his writing pitfalls like Silverman or Bragg do. It seems like, both in the writing and the voice direction, the only idea the developers had for this character is he's Vaz from Far Cry 3. Fuck you! I'll show you what I mean. Good morning, my friend. You've been busy, haven't you? Killing 30 of my men. That's very fucking brave of you. You must be some kind of badass, huh? You know who those men had for a boss. Probably some psychotic raider warrior. You're right. They had me. Rossman took a lot from me. He took my family, he took my boss, my money, my home. Do you know what that does to a man? It's really hard to take the raider path seriously as a story when the character who is essentially the front man of the whole operation is doing an impression of a better written antagonist. For the first half of the raider path, we essentially do everything we did on the NCR side, but accelerated and on the other end. For example, that battle on the highway, we're doing the exact same thing, but we're killing NCR instead of raiders. Where this took significantly more time in the NCR path, we do all of this way faster because there's far less filler in the in-betweens. I can see this making the raider path a poor experience for first time players, but let's be honest, nobody's playing raider on their first run, that's a fake criticism. The raider path becomes a little more interesting when we make our way to Aziabula. Els Dragon wants the tribe's leader's head so we can control and enslave the remaining tribal population. You can take him out via combat, convince him to sacrifice himself, or you can sit by the fire with him and talk for a while. You are from the wasteland after all, he knew your parents and he knows what you are. If you take this option and hear him out, you actually learn about Project Brazil and that you're a mutant clone of the Vault Dweller several hours early. To the tribe leader, your clone status has been in some way corrupted. The Vault Dweller of legend that he knows would not be doing the things you do in this playthrough. A clone of the character who saved Tandy from the cons would not turn on Tandy's legacy alongside any raider faction. You are, then, the destroyer. And he only pleads that you direct your violent, corrupted nature against those who did this to you and those who seek to use you. Elsdragon, Silverman, Duville, Bragg, and the Father. 
This moment opens up in our minds the possibility of a wildcard ending. We'll get to it, but for now, we're still Raider McMurderface or whatever Vaz, I, I mean Els Dragon, keeps calling us. So we take his head or his dead brother's head and pass it off as his, so Els Dragon will think you've done what he wanted. Either way, the head doesn't really matter. Els Dragon doesn't even take it from you and you get back. Once this is done, we're right into the reverse NCR parallel quest line again. Dagger point, vault dweller reveal, dagger point again to kill the father and the enclave. I would have liked a little more of an emphasis on the corruption of the vault dweller like there was with the tribe leader, but the father and Bragg barely remark on what you were supposed to be versus what you've become, except if you're originally part of the Enclave, which I suppose now is as good a time as any to dive into. The Enclave questline is not a questline so much as it is a single quest which adds flavor to one of the other actually existing questlines. If you advance through the Enclave story up to the point where you leave the vault, every now and again through the story you will receive little calls or updates from Bragg advising you on what to do or giving you help in the form of stashed supplies or airdrops. At the very end of one of the two main questlines, you can reunite with the Braggs, and instead of fighting them, you fight an Ioran. The Enclave's ending is really something special, but I promised I would keep my mouth shut, so let's talk about the Shi. The Shi are a group you may or may not be aware of if you're familiar with Fallout. In Fallout 2, San Francisco is under the control of the Shi, an isolationist faction of remnants of a Chinese submarine that beached in San Francisco after the Great War. I didn't really like this Shi in Fallout 2 when I reviewed it because San Francisco as an area felt both unfinished and like it didn't connect enough with the wider world of the game. The Shi as a faction are conceptually interesting, but the player is allowed to observe virtually none of their nuances. I'm happy to say that the Shi path in New California pleasantly surprised me. We can begin this path on either side of the aisle, NCR or Raider, when our faction leader tells us to turn the power back on at this relay station. Here we'll find Kiva, the leader of the Shi in this game. Most players will notice immediately that Kiva is Japanese and not Chinese, a fact which does have an explanation in lore, but which still makes her feel kind of out of place. I can't tell whether they did this because they had access to a Japanese voice actress but not one who could speak Chinese, or if they genuinely intended for her to be Japanese because they thought the whole samurai angle would be cool. In either case, Kiva's heritage is one of the stranger aspects of the mod. After helping her defend the station, we can learn a lot more about her and the splinter tribe she's a part of and help her out a little. Her grand plan is to unite the tribes of California to overthrow Els Dragon, freeing his slaves and preventing a war between the raiders and the NCR. From here on out, the quest progresses similarly to that of the Enclave or the Mob. We follow our main questline, picking all of our faction's unique dialogues to advance that side angle to the main story we're made to follow. At the boiling point of the Shi questline, we can challenge Els Dragon to a one-on-one -on -one combat and give a speech to the remaining raiders and slaves to help us fight back against the mutants at Dagger Point. We go to Dagger Point, Master Enclave ending. I really like the Shi path, actually. It feels thematically apt and it provides a nice third option you can take after you realize that the other two factions have serious issues. The only other remaining option for how things shake out is the pure wildcard ending. If you follow the advice of the leader of the California tribes and fulfill your destiny as the destroyer, you can kill Els Dragon, Duville, the father, and Silverman, and if you do this you get a unique ending. New California's ending slides send the final nail in the coffin of the mod's story for most of the people who played it. There are a number of controversial or cheesy story moments throughout New California, but the ending slides take the cake. Let's go through the unique faction-specific endings before we hit the big red button and send it all up in flames. If you sided with the NCR, this area of California is made fully into NCR territory, and the NCR uses this new land as a path towards Vegas and the Hoover Dam. Where you fire your missile determines what happens to General Silverman and what your status becomes in the NCR. Fire the missile at the Enclave and you and Silverman are heroes. Fired at the mutants and Silverman is sent to a prison in the frontier actually and you are exiled. If you sided with the raiders, Elves Dragon fights with the NCR until he is fully subsumed by Caesar's Legion. If you launch the nuke at all, Elves Dragon pretty much immediately fails to hold California and flees to Arizona. If you keep the nuke under Elves Dragon's thumb as a deterrent against the the NCR, the raiders take up base in Fort Daggerpoint. Els Dragon and his raiders become irradiated and mutated and flee California voluntarily. If you sided with the mob and you sent the nukes, Duville finds himself fleeing with the raiders to Caesar's Legion. 
Okay. If you keep the nukes for Duville, he opens up Reno's businesses to the now vacant raider mines and creates some sense of economy in the former slave resource farm. Getting a little repetitive now, if you sided with a Shi and you launch the warhead, the Shi are assimilated by the Legion. If you didn't, the NCR and the Shi strike up an alliance and work together towards the betterment of California. The wildcard ending where you kill all of the faction leaders is the most chilling. It's entirely in black and white, and there's no narration. The YouTube description posts by the devs for this one reads paraphrased as this. A lot of players who got this ending were bothered that there is no narration, because there isn't any. There's no one left alive to narrate. Uga, who's the tribe leader, warns you that given your eternal life and penchant for murder, you will kill everything that lives out of sheer boredom. This is actually my favorite ending. The She Peace ending comes after that, and the NCR Exile ending after that. My least favorite ending is the one we haven't yet discussed, the Enclave. Brace yourself. After accomplishing your mission, you join the Enclave on a trip out east, to Washington, D.C. That's right, you join the Fallout 3 Enclave for the events of that game. After the Enclave lose, you go to Chicago and send out a ton of iBots looking for the remaining Enclave units across the US. You're really hitting all the stops here. The one that responds is of course Edie and Hopeville. Oh, why is that an of course? Why did I say that? Oh, okay, uh, after the shenanigans in California, with the exception of the mutant and wildcard endings, you find your way in one way or another to the newly established town of Hopeville, and the key to Fort Daggerpoint you still have with you sets off the nukes that create the Lonesome Road. You take up work as a courier in the Mojave, and thanks to your mutant vault dweller clone powers, survive a shot to the head from the man in the checkered suit. The main character in New California is not just allegedly the vault dweller, but is directly the courier. New California is a direct prequel to New Vegas. I can't overstate it, people hate this. I would wager a lot of money that if you did a poll of New California players and asked them what the dumbest aspect of the story was, they wouldn't say the stuff about the clones, they wouldn't say the teenagerish companions, they wouldn't say the Enclave only being present in the beginning and the end of the main quest, or even the fact that in the Enclave ending you go on a cross-country road trip and end up being one of the unnamed Enclave troopers from Fallout 3. They would say that the dumbest aspect of New California is that they force your player to become the courier. And you know what? I disagree. I'll say it. This fact gets a lot more hate than it deserves. This final sting is obviously cheesy. It's undoubtedly one of the most fanfiction-y aspects of the mod, but it opens some interesting things up to think about. First and foremost, it lets the player keep playing after the endgame. That's cool. It even adds a quest to reintroduce the companion characters, now older and aged. With how seriously underwritten all of these characters are, this was a major surprise for me. This choice to continue the game with some of the old characters opens up New Vegas to an entirely different perspective and gives a unique opportunity for role-playing. The main issue cited for people disliking this ending is that they don't like the courier being an established character. Personally, and this might just be me, I like my characters to be characters. I don't like blank slates in RPGs because stories with complete blank slates feel impersonal. It's hard to feel the weight of the events that occur to my character when their background only exists in my brain. Obviously, there needs to be the ability for the player to directly pick or influence what kind of character they play, but I like having a frame. If you want to, the events of New California can provide a hell of a frame for a fresh New Vegas playthrough. The protagonist of this mod being the courier all along didn't ruin it for me. There are much deeper and more foundational problems, as well as even dumber plot stings if you prefer to look at things that way. The entire Enclave faction in this mod is botched and unfinished. The companion, dialogue, and leveling systems of this mod create a perfect storm that makes skills largely irrelevant and incentivizes the player to keep picking the same perk over and over again for the entire runtime. The companions and the world space are at best prototypes. There are 13 endings for what is essentially two faction quest lines, and even those two factions are pretty much just mirrors of each other. What this means is that there are so many different impactful choices to be made, but very little replay value overall. You might want to see all of those endings, but you absolutely will not want to clear the I-15 bridge or walk from Union City to Zabula again. If you ask me, the courier thing is the least of New California's problems. From how I engaged with New California, the big theme that I sensed is one introduced in the opening monologue, character. And if you don't think character is the only factor in deciding victory, 
and you've been playing the wrong game this whole damn time. It doesn't matter what you are, it matters who you are. To destroy the mutant threat, you need to look past what you are. That what is the claim that your existence is merely as a clone of the Vault Dweller. Instead, the player embraces who they are, the character they've built as a nerd or a jock, a charismatic mafioso, or a loyal ally of the Shi. Even as a representative of the factions, though, the player's given options to do their own thing. The NCR wants to put you in a box as an unaffiliated asset, the Enclave wants to make you a soldier, the mob an agent of their will. In all of these cases, what they want you to be is more important to them than who they want you to be. At the end of the day, they don't care about character, they care about function. Anaya Ran is a really interesting case when thinking about this because she is literally multiple different characters at once. She's been cloned into four people. Two of them are fully brainwashed by Enclave dogma such that they only consider what they are as Enclave agents without much consideration for everything else. At first glance, it may seem like a break in logic that they want to destroy all mutants while they themselves are mutated, but they don't see that as what they are. What they are is Enclave, full stop. Inversely, Anaya Ran identifies a lot more with the mutated aspect of herself. She is permanently self-conscious of her mutation as what she is, after having lived a far too long life to be able to ignore it. At the end of most playthroughs, she sacrifices herself, killing herself alongside her clones because even in the end, none of them truly overcame what they were in favor of a life worth living as who they were. And then there's Dr. Rossman, probably the only truly down-to-earth character in the whole story. Rossman, or his hologram, doesn't want anything from you. He is supportive of who you want to be. There's no wonder why he's the most likable character. He's the only one who actually understands what Bragg was talking about in the opening. Yeah, I don't have to tell you you're walking into a trap. You know. You're gonna need everything you got to take out the father and his enclave pals. Don't be afraid, though. You can do it. After that, I suggest you nuke the place and get out of there. Get a real job. Settle down somewhere. Live long and prosper. This ain't no life for old men. If you get lucky, thank the stars and cash out. Have you ever heard of the serial position effect? This is probably the most YouTube video essayist ass conclusion segue I've ever done, but for real, have you? The serial position effect basically finds that in human psychology, individuals recall the first and last things that happen in a series best. The pilot and the finale, the introduction and the conclusion, these will be the parts you remember the most when you're asked about the series later in life. New California is fascinating when you consider this effect. It begins phenomenally everything that happens in the vault is great. It's tight, it's packed, the space feels lived in, and the setup is creative. There is a ton to learn about the world if you want to, a ton of opportunities for roleplaying too. The vault is the only section of the mod that feels truly finished, like all hands were on deck. Then when you look at the endings, people hate these, broadly speaking. For the courier thing, for the enclave weirdness, for the vault dweller reveal and the cloning stuff and the superhuman powers, the endings to New California are deeply confusing. They are all over the place and feel broadly amateurish from a pure fiction writing perspective. So the beginning and the end are remembered best. The beginning to New California is awesome, and the ending is the precise opposite. If people forget about all the middle stuff as they are so inclined to do, they will recall the entire experience in one of two ways. They will either have immense difficulty explaining New California due to the inherent contradiction of the two polar opposites they do remember, or they'll just straight up choose to ignore one or the other so that they can have an opinion and square that circle in their minds. This is why coverage of New California online is so all over the place. You have people saying it's one of the best experiences in modding, and people saying it's an abomination that ruins the lore forever. And then you have this contingent of dizzy forget-me-nots in the middle, like, it was good, but also bad? When I covered the frontier, my overarching impression was that it had phenomenal parts and absolutely terrible parts, and while that technically applies here, there is a clear difference. New California is not finished, and its worst aspects reflect that. It isn't a complete, refined, terrible package in the same way the NCR campaign of the frontier is. It's not very enjoyable in large part because it has a missing middle wider than its empty world space. Due to this, it's hard to call New California bad because, as I mentioned early on, 
on, you can see what it was going for and most of those goals are good, but they never reached any of them after that opening vault section. Is it bad or is it just unfinished? Does that state of unfinishedness doom it to the final conclusion that it's bad? I can't really say. I can say that it's just as fascinating as the frontier was even if for completely different reasons. How I put it to someone in conversation is that when you play the frontier you think to yourself how and why did they do this, but when you play New California you think wow they really could have actually done this. It's a bit of a drab note to end this video on but it's worth saying that there have been efforts in the past to rewrite and rework New California and the lead developer has published all of the design documents and plans that the original team had for the mod, so if you're an insane person you could hop on that, or if you're only an insane person in the wishful thinking kind of way you can sit back and hope that someone else will hop on it for you, and if you're an extra insane person you can spend multiple months writing about New California and analyzing it in hopes that someone else will hop on it. As always I'd like to thank my patrons with a special thank you to Adam Souza, Autumn Vector, Dominus Pyrite, Holly Jenka, It's Ducktastic, Jack Bradley, Joseph Gaska, Michael Aversa, Ryan Little, Spritz, Talia Hemke, and Zachary Shannon. If you'd like to support me, you can go to the Patreon in the description or you can join the channel via channel memberships on YouTube. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.